Good evening, everybody. My name is Yasue Kodama Yanai. I'm a professor of the Japanese program at San Jose State University. Thank you all for joining us at our today's event entitled, What Makes Our Society Accepting? Our course, JPN 102B, Local and Minority Cultures of Japan, is a new course that began in fall 2020 to explore Japanese immigration and diaspora. When I was planning, planning this course in spring 2020, coincidentally, the coronavirus uh, pandemic started. And since then, we have been witnessing many social injustice and inequalities including an increase in hate crimes against Asians. These types of social discrimination overlapped with the numerous hardships that Japanese immigrants went through in the past and motivated me to uncover the secret of the culturally tolerant societies. Because Montreux and our hometown, San Jose, seems to be more uh, relatively tolerant toward Japanese immigrants compared to other areas. The Montreux Peninsula has been a tolerant society towards immigrants throughout its history. Montreux people welcome the Japanese Americans' return from the internment camp at the end of World War II with a full page newspaper advertisement titled, The Democratic Way of Life for All, collecting signatures from more than 440 people. On the other hand, San Jose unanimously opposed the Japanese return during World War II, but ended up accepting twice as many Japanese American after World War II. In our course, we work together, reading various related literature, website articles, and local and campus newspapers, as well as interviewing local historians and Japanese Americans. We approach our research questions from various perspectives, such as geography, history, culture, and social psychologies to find out the secrets of the culture return societies. Culture develops based on the nature of environment and history first, but ultimately speaking, prejudice and discriminations are matters of human psychology. So, we ask for cooperation from the uh, psychology major students, and then they introduce to us the following four theories. Please look at the slide. The first one is the realistic group conflict theory. According to it, the real or perceived scarcity of resources, such as natural resources, food, and jobs, is the cause of the conflict between groups. That means that the more resources we have, the less conflict we have. The second theory is the social impact theory. According to it, the amount of the influence an individu individual receive in a group settings depends on the strengths such as power or social status and the immediacy of the group. And the number of the people exerting the social influence in the group. The third theory is called the contact theory. According to it, the people can promote tolerance and acceptance by collaborating with 
people from other cultures as equals toward common goals. The fourth theory is called the social learning theory. According to it, behaviors are developed and learned through observation. The typical case is that the children learn how to behave from their parents' behaviors through of their observation. So today, we're going to try to explain why Montre and San Jose have been relatively tolerant societies from these perspectives. So now, I'm going to introduce today's presenters and guest speakers. First, okay. I'm going to introduce my students. This is Keisha Kraft. <laughs> she's a Japanese major, and she's a representative of spring 2020 class when we researched Montre. And this is Ruen Win. Mm -hmm. She's an animation illustration major, and she's a representative of fall 2021 class when we researched San Jose. And Yuan is an international student from Vietnam. And both of the students are most outstanding students in the classes. And they wrote ex excellent papers at the end of the semesters. Now I'm going to introduce guest speakers. First, Tim, Tom Tim Thomas. Tim Thomas is a fourth generation native of the Montreux and a fisheries historian who has researched the fisheries of Monterey Bay for over 25 years. For 16 years, he had been the historian and curator for the Montreux Maritime Museum. Tim has many publications, such as Montreux's Waterfront, the Japanese on the Monterey Peninsula, and the Abalone King of Monterey. Second, uh, uh, second, he's a project director and director of the J.B. Phillips Historical Fishery Report, in addition to the historical cons consultant for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Tim is also on the board of director of Monterey Japanese American Citizen League, as well as curator of Japanese American Heritage Center. Next, next speaker is Ralph Pierce. He is the third generation San Jose'an who grew up with a great love for history. He has published two books so far. One is From Asahi to Zebra, Japanese American Baseball in San Jose, California. The other is San Jose, Japan Town, A Journey, which was co-authored with Kurt Fukuda. He currently works in the King's Library's California Room, the San Jose Public Library State, and lo Local History Collection. Lastly, this is Warren Hayashi. Warren was born in Vocaville, California, as the eldest son of a fruit farmer. He began his primary education in Vocaville, but he and his family were sent to internment camp in Gila, Arizona during World War II. After the World War II, he moved to Santa Clara Valley with his family which was when he was 11 years old. He completed his elementary and secondary education in Santa Clara. He then attended San Jose Junior College and graduated from San Jose State with a BA in secondary education and MA in general secondary teaching credential program. 
He had been a teacher in the Santa Clara Unified School District for 40 years and retired in 1996. He has also served many organizations in San Jose's Japantown. Then shall we move to our presentation? So Keisha, let's do it. Okay, so first I'll be talking about the contributing factors that our class found um, uh, made a difference into why the Japanese immigrants and the Japanese Americans were welcomed back into Monterey. So to kick it off, let's just talk about the Monterey Peninsula in general, the Monterey Bay region. Um, when I say Monterey, all I can think about is the amazing aquarium, but uh, the region actually extends further inland all the way to about Salinas, but the cities that I'm mainly gonna be talking about are Monterey, Pacific Grove, Point Lobos, and Carmel by the Sea. Now, Carmel Bay and Point Lobos, um, as well as Mon Monterey Bay, um, they had, had this incredible rich, diverse sea life on the coast, um, as well as um, land, uh, natural land resources that allowed people in the area to make a living through fishing and other means. Um, and that eventually led to the Monterey Harbor becoming the first international trading port in California in uh, 1822. Um, and Point Lobos later became um, known as an international business park um, for about 50 years from 1850 to the 1900s. So further talking about the geographical and climatic factors of the area, something that's really unique um, to these areas um, are the coastal traits, right? So these, uh, there's something called intertidal zones that are really unique to this area. And so these are things that are full of, of rocks and kelp. Um, that are essential for the growth of abalone. We're gonna be talking a lot about abalone today. Um, but, so this, this diverse and rich sea life um, allowed for fishing niches. So that meant that all the immigrant uh, fishers uh, in the area didn't have to compete with each other. They could each take their own um, specific type of fish and, and therefore there was no um, economic competition in that way. They weren't competing with each other and they weren't competing with any other um, white American groups. And so, moving on to, to talk further about the fishing niches. So, the vast majority of the Monterey community, and I would assume um, in American life, there really was no use for abalone. I personally have never tried abalone, and it's on my, it's on my list of things to do. Um, but that left, left a hole for the Japanese um, community to come in, and they took over from the Chinese immigrants in the area, and they brought their special know-how and their special equipment um, to dive for deeper abalone. Um, and the Italians had sardines and the Portuguese were whalers. Now this uh, type of uh, non-competitive atmosphere actually led to an ununified, unsegregated fishing union and that was established in um, 1915. And in comparison to many of the other farming jobs that were in like Salinas or um, further inland, um, fishing was way more of a money maker than farming, right? So fisher, uh, fishermen were making $25 a day versus $2 a day for the average farmer. And now this all plays in to what Kodama Sensei has taught us about realistic group conflict theory. So there was less competition and therefore less conflict. Um, so another important factor was having what I called friends in high places um, and a collaboration in the cannery business. Now um, I can talk about this man named uh, Alexander McMillan Allen um, who I believe had uh, roots from Ireland. Uh, his parents were also immigrants. Now he ended up purchasing all of the land in Point Lobos. So he was the founder of Point Lobos and really no one could tell him you can't support who you wanna support. Um, and he partnered with uh, Genosuke Kodani and they created the uh, Point Lobos Canning Company. And this was hugely economically and financially successful and it was the backbone of um, uh, the Monterey uh, economy, providing jobs as well as um, uh, economic resources. And their 30-year business partnership uh, was lucrative for the area, but it also created close family ties um, that tied the people to, the, to each other and to the area. Um, another individual, his name is Pops Ernest. He was a German immigrant known as the Abalone King. And he was very boisterous and had a very big personality. And so he used this um, in some marketing ideas, making songs and things like that. Um, and he created an abalone recipe and partnered with um, the abalone fishermen. 
Um, and then the last person is the founder of Carmel, um, James Frank Devendorf, and there's the co-founder, Frank Power. And now I believe uh, James Frank Devendorf was a friend of AMA, um, and he was also a liberal thinker, thinker who was very welcoming towards the um, Japanese community. And this plays into the social impact theory as well as contact theory. A huge, huge factor um, into the success of the Japanese community was the strong and respectable Issei leaders of the, of the uh, different areas. Um, there's obviously way many more than can fit on this slide, but you know, for the purposes of time, um, we'll be talking about three. Um, so first we have Oto, Sabura, uh, Oto Saburo Noda, um, and he was in Monterey, and he was what we deemed a visionary leader. Among other things, um, in 1895, he was the one who uh, found the potential in the abundancy of abalone in the area, and he took it upon himself to contact um, the Japanese Agriculture and Commerce Department, and that in turn um, had the government, the Japanese government supporting emigration to the area. Secondly, we have Genosuke Kodani, who I mentioned earlier, and he was prolific in Point Lobos as a business leader. So in 1897, thanks to Noda, um, he brought his, uh, the Chiba abalone diving tradition, as well as the equipment necessary um, to uh, deep dive for the abalone. And like I mentioned, he formed the Point Lobos Canning Company with AMA. And lastly, we have Kumahiko Miyamoto, who was um, in Cam uh, Cam Carmel. I was gonna say Campbell. Um, he was in Carmel, um, and he was what we deemed a moral leader. He was a first generation farmer that was credited to bringing artichokes, uh, artichoke farming to Carmel. And I also read that he planted the very first Christmas tree um, in Pacific Grove, like at the entrance of Pacific Grove. Um, and what he did was he showed incredible support um, to needy individuals and families during the Great Depression who needed food. He would um, deliver agriculture supplies like milk and um, produce um, to them directly. And the, uh, these individuals played a huge um, part in what we uh, have relayed now as the social impact theory as well as contact theory. Something of note um, is the adaptations of the Japanese immigrants. So um, the Chinese immigrants who were the predecessors to um, the Japanese community um, sort of isolated themselves and didn't take to um, enculturating themselves into the American um, way of life and that kind of worked against them. But um, the Japanese community actually prioritized American enculturation and adaptation to American culture. And they did these things by uh, celebrating American holidays. So like for 4th of July, they would make a big showing, and I think it was um, a women's group, a uh, Japanese uh, um, women's group who created, the, or who sewed a huge, um, yeah, uh, American flag that they proudly waved around, and they participated in events like this, um, as well as dressing in American fashions, um, and um, uh, also converting to uh, the Christian religion which was obviously popular in, in the area. Um, now the first uh, draw of going to these Christian churches was the English language programs um, that was necessary to learn the language. Um, but the Japanese also have um, a, a religious flexibility that allowed them to take in the Christianity without it being um, disingenuous. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, we have three cities in the um, Monterey Peninsula. We have Watsonville, Monterey, and Salinas. And we have a B here that represents the establishment of the Buddhist temple, and then the C here that represents um, when the Christian churches were um, founded. And these were founded by the Japanese communities, right? Um, so we can see a pattern in all three of these, that the Christian churches were built before the Buddhist temples, showing that they, they um, prioritized creating, you know, the... Um, uh, the Christian religion over their uh, Buddhist religion. But I have highlighted Monterey because it has a bigger gap than all of the other cities. Um, so way much more time went by before the community decided that they wanted to um, build their Buddhist temple. And that we can only speculate on, but it could have shown to the other non-Japanese communities that they were committed to their Christian faith. Um, we also have sports, which we know can be um, a social bonding tool. Um, there were all Japanese baseball and basketball leagues that I think occasionally had white coaches. Um, so that played into the um, social learning theory and contact theory. Um, but last but not least, we also have the Japanese American Citizens League, which is still alive and functioning today. Um, but for me personally, this was the establishment of this um, 
uh, uh, Citizens League showed that we are Japanese Americans and we want to build a community for us to talk to each other and to outreach to other communities. And I think that that, that was very important. So now we can move on to the Issei support of uh, the American forces in World War I, as well as the Nisei active duty in World War II. Um, so in 1917, the Japanese Association of America, um, which was comprised of the Issei community, showed support for the US troops and many attempts to actually enlist into World War I, but they were denied for lack of American citizenship. Um, and then in World War II, um, the, uh, the uh, young men who were interned at the, the camps were actually recruited from the camps um, into making a segregated unit um, in World War II called the 442nd Infantry Regiment. So this was almost exclusively um, a Nisei combat unit. And even to this day, they are known as the most decorated unit for its size in US military history. Um, and then we have here on the left, we have um, a letter written by Mrs. Sumida. And this was written to the Monterey Herald um, to thank the community for their support. Um, so I can read that now. My husband is fighting, fighting in Italy now, along with hundreds of other Nisei soldiers, fighting for what he believes is right, the American way of life. Someday when the war is over, we hope to return to Monterey with our little son. I wanna thank the people of Monterey who wrote to the Herald to defend us. I know as long as there are people like that left in this country, all the Nisei boys did not die in vain, and what they fought for will live on. Respectfully yours, Mrs. Yukio Sumida. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, this plays into contact theory and social impact theory. So now we can move on to the multicultural communities and liberal thinking residents of the Monterey Bay region. So as I discussed earlier, we now know that there was a high population of immigrants in the area for the fishing industry and populating the canneries as workers. Um, but there was a, a respect between the communities and an interaction. So the children of the Japanese communities were playing with the Italian children and they were exchanging the language and, and that contact really built a respect and camaraderie. There was also um, many artistic and intellectuals within um, communities in the area um, that were liberal thinkers who may not have been embedded in the communities themselves, but they respected immigrants just on the basis of human rights. Um, so we have some photos here of Ed Weston, who is a famous photographer. We have Ed Ricketts, who is a marine, marine biologist, ecologist, and ph philosopher. His laboratory is still on Can Cannery Row for viewing, very famous. Mm -hmm. um, and Tony Jackson. Um, we also have John Steinbeck, the famous author, and Thor Crow, who was um, a high school principal in the community. Um, now these people played um, a big part in uh, the social impact theory. So there was a very amazing thing that happened um, in the newspaper of the Monterey Peninsula Herald. So um, towards the end of the internment of the Japanese in 1944, um, oh, I suppose we could do background information first. So let's remember in 1942, Roosevelt signed um, Executive Order 9066, which called for the relocation and incarceration of over 120,000 Japanese descendants and Japanese Americans in the uh, Central Coast. Um, and that was from 1942 to, to 1944. Um, and so when the, the Japanese were returning to their communities, um, people had written into the Monterey Peninsula Herald declaring that they didn't want these people back. Um, and the, the local communities read these, um, read these letters and they were outraged and they sent their own letters of protest back. Um, and we can see in um, some of these quotes fighting back, you know, are we going to fight economic competition by taking away the civil rights and freedom of our competitors regionally or as a world policy? Um, and another good quote was, shall we sow hatred or love? And now a lot of these were written and signed by many of the advocates that I had mentioned earlier um, who were just trying to proclaim their advocacy of, democ of democratic freedom and the welcoming back of the Japanese communities. Um, there were also comparisons to, um, uh, you know, uh, there being like a Hitler run country in the area, you know what I mean? The, making that comparison, which was obviously fresh on the minds of American citizens. Um, and finally, on the far right, we have a very important document um, called the Democratic Way of Life for All. Now, what this originally was, was a petition calling for residents of Monterey 
um, to ensure the democratic way of life of those of Japanese ancestry who would be returning to their homes in the Monterey Peninsula. And now this petition was circulated and signed by like over 440 people within two and a half weeks um, in 1945. And I believe this was pushed and uh, really started by Tony Jackson. Um, so after it was all signed, they published it in the Monterey Peninsula Herald and it really made a big statement. Um, and I think uh, Tim Thomas, uh, there's a quote by Tim Thomas that uh, really sums up why this is an important document. Um, he says, there's no other known act like this during the war in which non-Japanese Americans stood up as a community for their Japanese friends and neighbors. These petitions represent a really unique moment in American civil rights history, unquote. And the, as I mentioned earlier, there were famous you know, um, writers and um, uh, prolific people, but there, it was just community people who wanted to sign this for their friends. Like, please let my friends come home. And so to tie it up, um, as a, you know, a nice conclusion, um, putting the social psychology theories to um, some of the factors that I mentioned above, we have the um, realistic group conflict theory, which was avoided um, thanks to the fishing niche of abalone as well as the canneries. We had the social impact theory um, that had influential support from powerful and well-spoken individuals, um, as well as a high number of immigrants in the area. We also had contact theory, which was seen in the collaborative businesses and multicultural communities, as well as the Nisei military service. And then we had the social learning theory, which was seen in the Japanese community's adaptation to American culture. We can get a little resources. Okay, thank you very much for nicely organizing what we researched together. And so now uh, we're gonna um, uh, ask questions to Tim Thomas, who is the author of the book of uh, Jap the Japanese on the Monterey Peninsula, we read in the class. So he's like a hero. I know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I get to see what he looks like. Tim, can you hear us? So he is uh, joining, he's joining us from Monterey through Zoom meeting. Can you hear us? Hello? <laughs> Tim? Could be frozen. Oh, no. oh. oh. <laughs> we are in pyramid. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you. Have any of you tried abalone? No? Oh, okay. Yeah, my aunt made really good abalone congee. Oh, cool. I know. Oh. Yeah, I think, I don't think the abalone fishing is still going on anymore. So he needs to rejoin. I don't think so. Or at least there wasn't in yeah, when we were anyway. doing like quick research yeah. on Monterey. Can I call? He's probably doing what he can to um, yeah. to get back on. Who knows how long it's been frozen? <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure all the land in Point Lobos was donated um, from the AMA family to the government. So is there any questions regarding the presentation? If you have any oh, yes. questions. Ha so it's now um, a park reserve. Tim, you can could you there. rejoin yeah, the Lobos. meeting? Is Point Lobos? Could you restart your um, Ooh, I wouldn't know. Zoom Oh, Zoom I just know from the map, Point Lobos is right under <laughs> the water. Oh yeah, it might be. Yeah. Hmm. I have a friend who, um, um, whose mother was from Watsonville. Oh. And I have a letter, I didn't bring it with me, but 
it, it's a letter from her mother's teacher in, the in 1942. And during the war, she kept in, the teacher kept in touch with her mother during the war. And all these different emotions are being expressed in these letters. But um, uh, really, the, 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 the teacher, the Caucasian teacher that was still in Watsonville was just incensed. Yeah. And she was very, um, um, very well spoken in terms of, uh, I mean, the letter could have been written today right. uh, uh, in terms of the unfairness and the injustice yeah. and uh, uh, how the, the people in the higher ups had caused this injustice to happen. And I text him. Everybody else did and not also feel I the same way or share those same feelings. And, mm -hmm. I mean, there were uh, like all of the famous people who signed the petition, but it was really the locals. It was it was the um, uh, the high school teachers. It was the principal who I think he was actually removed from his position for supporting um, the return. Uh, um, and I think in Salinas as well, the uh, teacher community um, created like a sister city program with uh, a city in Japan, and so they actually got together and went to Japan to learn about you know the heritage of their students, which is incredible. Uh, so teachers make a difference. Yeah. 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 That's why I'm teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, it seems like it uh, have a mechanical problem in joining. So do you think we should wait or should we wait? Mm. We can always come back to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to yeah. like reach? Yeah, we can. Okay. Let's move, jump on to San Jose then. Okay. So we're gonna uh, move on to San Jose case, and wait for Tim to come back. All right. So, can you do your? Oh. Yeah. I do they need to like switch okay. the screen or? Oh yeah. There we go. See. Okay. Um. So hello. I'll be. Uh, presenting the finding research that we did in our class last semester, uh, specifically about Japanese returnees in the Santa Clara Valley. And I just want to quickly walk you guys through like the first couple photos that we have here on the slide. So on the far left, we're seeing um, at a train station, the train's called the Heart Mountain Number no. 2 Special Train, and it's taking about 100 Santa Clara evacuees back to the South Bay. And it was reported at the time when the train arrived, there were Japanese and Caucasian friends waiting in their cars with like genuine words welcoming the evacuees back in Palo Alto, um, Sunnyvale, and also Mountain View. Um, in the middle, we're seeing the photos of Norman Mineta's family. Norman is the former mayor of San Jose, also a councilman. And his family was also one of many, many families that was forced to remove and relocate it to a relocation center during the detainment. And then on the far right, we're seeing the, f the photos of the first family, the Yamamoto family, the first family that returned to Santa Clara County after leaving the camps. And they were just back into their bushberry and tomato growing business with a small stand in Cupertino. And so a quick introduction about the whole research. Um, so prior to World War II, it was documented that there were about 43 commu Japanese community across California. And they're all called like Japantown, or if you guys like known it as Nihomachi. And these Japantowns offer um, Japanese owned businesses, organization, and then employment. Basically serve kind of um, like a means of protection and also survival for the growing Japanese population in the area. However, after World War II, there, was all, there were only three Japantowns left in California, and it's in Los Angeles, then San Francisco, and then in San Jose. And then when we're looking at out of only the three remaining Japan towns, only in Santa Clara County, where the San Jose Japan town resides still until this day, only in Santa Clara that they saw a dramatic increase of the Japanese American population after the war. So we will look through like some geographical and also economic, economic Factor, uh, factors and also discrimination and the support from the local resident to further explain why more Japanese uh, evacuees decide to return to Santa Clara. So 
starting with geographical and historical. So just in case you're not familiar with the area, then Santa Clara Val Valley basically ranges from the San Francisco Bay and then all the way through like Hollister in the south. And it's sitting between the two mountains, the Diablo Range and then the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, you're seeing photos and then also maps of the Alviso area. Alviso was the San Jose port city where there's a lot of like exciting bustling canning and trading activity going on. There's a lot of products and then produce that was like grown and in the, in the valley that was shipped all to the world starting from Alviso. Um, the dock, the Alviso dock was originally owned by Ignacio Alviso, hence the name Alviso. And um, there were a lot of like, there was like a wide categories of stuff that was going through, like going to the world through boat trading, like namely like tallow, grain, produce, lumber, and especially quicksilver, which was used to extract gold during like the gold rush. And then later on, when we realized that in the San Joaquin Valley area, like down south, wheat production was like really blooming. And then in Santa Clara Valley, the production waned in favor of fruit production. So we see the products here are like spinach, asparagus, or like prunes, apricots, peach, like all the fruits that you can ever like desire for, kind of. Um, also even like tomato sauce and then fruit cocktails. So there were obviously a lot of fruit farming opportunities here in the valley back then. With the farming opportunities here, we're looking at the climate and then basically the soil, like just how the, how the natural resources work here. And the climate pattern here is consistently mild and dry summer and then wet winter. And when we take into account the fertile soil here in the valley, it's just suitable for all kind of fruit producing. The nickname Valleys of Heart Delight was given to Santa Clara Valley for the charming farmland and also just orchards that stretch miles and miles. And then by early 20th century, Santa Clara Valley was already a major agricultural and um, fruit producing center in the country. So with such great opportunities for farming, white farmers here also rely a lot on labor, basically cheap labor to pick up their crops. And mainly during the late 19th and early 20th, it's mostly Asian labor. Um, so we see Japanese, uh, we see the Japanese laborers flock all the way to Santa Clara just to work at slow paid migrant worker in place of their Chinese predecessor. So previously, it was the Chinese labor here working for the white growers. However, because of the anti-Chinese sentiment and also coming, like following with the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, white farmers were eager for these cheap alternative labor and then there come the Japanese come and take place. They ended up taking over a majority of crop farming, like strawberry, celery. And then um, by World War II, there were probably like hundreds of Japanese farmers just growing vegetable and then supplying for the local and regional markets. With the plentiful extra fruits that they are collecting, there are a lot, can there are many canneries that opens up, and one of which is the now already closed Bayside, can Bayside Cannery Company, owned by the Chu family. And Bayside Canning Company was once the third largest cannery in the U.S., and it now serves as such a good reminder of the Alviso history in San Jose. We're looking at Thomas Fun Chu's photos. So Thomas, dad, Mr. Chu was the one who opened the Bayside Cannery Company in Alviso, but he originally only started with canning tomato when Thomas taking over the business. Well, he helped his dad with business earlier and then later taking over, he expanded to canning apricots, peaches, plum, and many more. Even local newspaper dubbed him with the nickname of the Asparagus King because he's just <laughs> finding a like, perfect thing the way of canning green asparagus. Bayside Canning Company was known for their generous pay for their worker, and they hire Chinese, and not only Chinese, but basically anybody who's willing to work for them, and that includes our Japanese migrant worker as well. By 1920s, then Bayside Canning was already become the third largest canning business in the country, and also providing a lot of job opportunities for migrant workers. Moving on to about to the Japanese economic successes and hardships in the country. 
So with the expansion of their Japanese own farm, then their farm, the farmers show great determination to secure permanency by purchasing land for, as property. Um, so after like, a lot of hard work and then labor intensive work, they were able to afford higher land rent fees and also buying fees. Um, um, by, by the 1920, they already like, own about like 16% of the irrigated farmlands in California and also contribute to the crop market, about 10% of the crop revenues. So you can see that like, their continuing success and also like, immense economic contribution should probably like, make them the most beloved communities of the area. Unfortunately, the immense economic contribution and all of the great things that they're doing in the country that they love led to an anti-Japanese hysteria. They were seen as economic competitors and threat to the local American white owners. And also, for living together in Japan towns or like Nihonmachi by gathering together and supporting communities, it was seen as evidence of their inability to assimilate into American society. And California decided that, well, we gotta change the law. We cannot let them own more lands because they're taking away lands of the local American. Um, in 1913, the alien land law that was previously applied to the Chinese as well added a prohibition which bar all aliens ineligible for citizenship and therefore all Asian immigrants from owning land in California, including the land that they bought years ago is now no longer like legal for like them to own. Many Japanese have no other choice rather than become sharecroppers. Other people set up land trusts but then other also register their property under the name of their Nisei children because they are legal U.S. citizen bond by 14th Amendment. Um, however, as I already said, the authority keep making changes to of like prohibit them from owning any property. In 1920, California alien land law amended to forbid the Issei from buying land in the names of their children or forbid, also forbidding them from being the guardians of a citizen in terms of land ownership. It's kind of like no matter how much money and resources that they save, they weren't allowed to own any kind of property or land. However, in Santa Clara, Japanese weren't completely isolated. They were received somewhat mild support from, the, from their business partner. Namely, an honest and warm Caucasian attorney, J.B. Peckham. He's a Stanford alumnus, and during the time of these alien, uh, during the time that the alien land war was like being active and causing a lot of hardship for Japanese, he was there and then helped purchase land and property in his name so that the Issei can pay him the mortgage and then later transfer ownership to their Nisei children when they reached like 21 years old. Uh, former mayor Norman Minera that we talked about like earlier in the presentation also say that Peckham helped ease the relationship between the whites and the Japanese uh, in Santa Clara, Santa Clara County to an quote unquote unusually good level considering how there was the residential segregation, like a strict segregation back then between Japan, Japanese, Chinese, and also the local white people. During the internment, J.B. Peckham also helped uh, wash over many of Japanese houses and home, allowing them to like easily resettle later on when they leave the camp. He was a great supporter. And businesses. And businesses as well. As well. And I think Peckham is a, such a good transition now that we can talk about the social perspective, basically just the support and discrimination that if, if happened in the area, also we'll be talking about not only authority and local resident, but also specific progressive um, religious group and in an educational, educational settings where we can see more support in there as well. So unfortunately, wartime hysteria still remain when, they, when the Japanese return to the camps. Um, the San Jose City Council and the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors all voted unanimously to oppose their return. And even Santa Clara mayors at the time, James Basigalupi, expressed that he was strongly against the return of Japanese 
because he believed that there will be conflicts between the veteran who already dedicated their effort and fight for the war with the Japanese who live in the area. Nonetheless, there are still some small numbers of allies. The newspaper editorials strongly, relentlessly encouraged the locals to show hospitality to the evacuees. And as mentioned earlier, we also have Dr. Uh, lawyer J.P. Peckham who helped wash over their, pro their property when they were away. Um, I want to share these two photos to like further explain there's other local support around the area, the San Jose area. So on the left, you're seeing the photos of John Della McGuire and the, some evacuees around him. He's a San Jose orchardist and in Santa Clara County, a, a rancher in Santa Clara County, and he helped solving the housing shortage to the evacuees. Um, by gathering just like all kind of lumbers that he could find until he can scrape together a couple of houses to help them have a place to shelter. On the right, we're seeing the returnees from Hurt Mountain and Gila. They are working on the Namimatsu celery farms. And the owner, Masashi Namimatsu, also known as dear, uh, for a dearer name as Frank, and he calls upon a considerable group of evacuees to just, hey, just like, come help me on my celery farm right here. There's a job there. And that's posed an opportunity for evacu or the evacuees to give him a hand on his ranch, in his ranch in San Jose. Basically, there's a lot of work in the fruit harvest area for everyone in Santa Clara County. And these are just a few examples of how the locals help the evacuees find settlement when they arrive in Santa Clara after the camps. In San Jose, there's still the San Jose Buddhist Church Betsuin. And the church, this church brought together and welcoming the Japanese immigrants when they first arrived in the San Jose area. During the uh, detainment, the church contributes space and storage so that the Japanese family or like all intern families can have a space to store all of their precious stuff. However, there's still anti-Japanese hostility during the time, and therefore it led to multiple vandalism incident to the church, and then their basement also have to suffer through a really intensive uh, fire um, in 1942 when like, the detainment just like, started. Um, there are other religious communities, such as the Congregational Church and the Council of Churches, were among the few communities that didn't turn their anger against um, the Japanese when Pearl Harbor News was broke out. Uh, I want to mention Reverend Stephen Peabody. He's known for being very socially progressive. He belongs to the Congregational Church. And when Pearl Harbor News was broke out, he organized a praying sessions and invited a lot, Japan, a lot of Japanese um, leaders in the communities to join him in the praying sessions. Um, his friend, Reverend Richard Nas of the Unitarian Church, he was the chairman of the Japanese American committees and was actively involving in helping the Nisei family after they leave the camps, helping them resettle in the area. We also have our friends, the Quakers, um, they belong to the Society of Friends. They were strong advocates opposing the unjust detainment and also offered to look after Japanese farms and property. They, have, uh, they founded the American Friends Service Committee and the committee helped in providing clothing, um, recreational and, and educational reading materials to Japanese college students in the camps. And our class decided to look into how our university, San Jose State University, uh, could play a role in supporting or helping um, the Japanese evacuees like resettle in Santa Clara. Um, you're seeing Dr. Thomas William McQuarrie. He's the 16th president of the San Jose State College, which is now San Jose State University. And Dr. McQuarrie was said that he um, have loved life people, his work, and he was probably the most popular resident in SJSU history. Um, in, in, one, um, in one of the sharing in the research that we're doing, that we did, um, it was said that the Nisei student was finding a hard time using public transportation because they would have to provide a lot of their information and thumbprint in order to get an ID card. And it there was like some trouble, some ringer there for them to just using public transport. 
and Dr. Macquarie was there conf like confirming, stood up and confirming that these Japanese students are in good standing so that they were able to just carry on with their normal life, going to, going to work, going to school, using public transportation, which supposedly should be a normal thing to other students at the time. Um, the Spartan Daily, a student-run newspaper on campus, did a poll where to ask whether the Japanese students should be welcomed back into the West Coast and unfortunately received a really negative response from the poll. Um, Dr. Macquarie expressed his disappointment and frustration about the opposition to the Japanese return on an article also published later on the Spartan Daily, and he called, in which he called the Japanese fine people, skilled, hardworking, intelligent, and then apologize on behalf of the campus attitude about like opposing their return. There are other notable supporters, namely Professor Claude Settles of the Social Science Department. He was also the advisor of the Japanese American Citizen League of Santa Clara. Professor Settles voices out his disappointment in the whole relocation effort. Um, in his article, also published in the Spartan Daily, called Settles, declared Japanese great loss to the, to the country. And basically, he was trying to highlight and emphasize the Japanese dedication and positive impact to the society, naming them the highest scoring university, study, uh, university students and also the best worker in town. Settles basically aiming to remind people of who they were trying to drive away for just mere fear of economic threat and discrimination. Um, another notable supporter in GLU geography, Professor Clara Hintz, he was organizing a campaign to raise study materials and send it to Japanese students in the relocation center. Professor Hintz was also the Japanese club advisor and, he was, and she was helping the club with a lot of activities, pioneering a lot of campaigns on campus, also helping the club becoming helping the club becoming the most active club by like 1940s. Okay, great. We also want to mention SGSU Student Christian Association. They created a commission for Japanese refugee to collect artwork that created by Japanese students in the camp and then showcasing the work outside, like in Santa Clara. Um, they also help house speaker that discuss about Japanese American experience in the, in the relocation camp or those who advocate for the Japanese American during the time. And then last but not least, we wanna mention the student run newspaper that we already mentioned a couple times earlier, the Spartan Daily. The Spartan Daily was trying to become an active platform, basically reflecting the campus attitude about the whole Japanese relocation matter. Um, there were reports of initiative and welcoming ideas about inclusion and then cooperation with people from other ethnic communities and of other nations. Um, there was also a report on Spartan Daily um, about a co-op housing attempt um, to include like students from different ethnic, like including Irish, Scotch, like English, and then Chinese and Japanese students to live together, welcoming as like a multicultural kind of environment. Um, with that, we, our class, conclude a few possibility explaining why the evacuees choose Santa Clara as a destination after leaving the camps. Um, the first one being the promising agricultural and cannery job opportunities where they are able to purchase home in the nearby neighborhood while still able to like go into farms or like nearby area where they're working. Many families return to the area without home or property because it was already destroyed uh, two years ago and they have no capital to like start earning a living for their family. Having a job opportunities or just ab abundant of jobs uh, options is a priority as they were trying to re resituate it in San Jose. The second reason being that um, by the time they were coming back, San Jose has become more and more multicultural, welcoming a lot, many ethnic, um, immigrants and then just people from other countries and of other ethnicity back to the uh, back to the area and in Norman's word he said that San Jose was such a special place because of its diversity my race was never discussed 
And we all believe that it was such a great point that because of racial diversity, it erases the racial distinction that initially caused all the anti-Asian sentiment happening before. And then last but not least, we believe that the general like, open and support and acceptance from the minority of the, the local communities, like namely the religious group, and then Lawyer Peckham, and then also the SGHU staff, those were, even though geographically small, but we believe that their support was impactful in helping the evacuees making the decision to go back to Santa Clara Valley. And you're seeing some photos of the San Jose, Japan town. Um, through the 50s and the 60s, then is the bustling years of activity for Japan town since the three generation were just coming back and forth in the neighborhood. And there's always that awareness that Japan town has always been made up just because just of small businesses and family businesses and residents without any corporation or any organization. There's no board of director making decision for them, and it was always about the communities. So even though after almost a century, so and San Jose Japan Towns probably or doesn't serve the same purpose, doesn't serve the same role as it was like a hundred years ago, but I think we believe that its existence will keep reminding us of a really rich and vibrant cultural community that we're still able to thrive until this day thanks to the warm hospitality given by the local residents. And that concludes our research. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for an uh, excellent presentation. So uh, we have finished the two presentations from my students. So we are going to shift to the uh, uh, second phase uh, and, and receive the comments to the, our research or advice to our uh, research. And also, uh, we are going to move to the Q&A sections. Hi, Tim. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know what happened. OK. I'm, my internet just died, that's all. <laughs> OK. OK. So, um, so your part is uh, Montre. Yep. And uh, I think you have listened to the uh, Keisha's presentation. Yes, I saw and, the whole presentation. It was oh, excellent. Okay. That's <laughs> cool. Good. Thank you. And so uh, do you have any comments or ad advice to us? regarding the um, research we did? I don't know. If, uh, I, I don't think I have any advice, uh, you know, in, in terms of comments. I thought it was an excellent program. I would like to point, uh, make a couple of comments that the, there were two people that really were the key to Monterey, uh, Japanese community and the welcome back of the Japanese community. And that was, of course, Noda. Without Noda, the Japanese community would not have come to Monterey. Right. And, and he really was the key. Uh, um, not just for Monterey, later on, of course, for all California Japanese community, he was a very important guy. And uh, also Tony Jackson in particular, uh, and the petition drive was really her, it was really women, all women that did that. And it was, and it was really Tony Jackson, who was then Ed Ricketts' living girlfriend at the time, who really fueled that and pushed that. She's the one who wrote it and wrote what's on there. So very important. Okay, so shall we ask the several questions? Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, um, the, the petition and a lot of the support of the Japanese community was female-led. Um, and we were wondering, um, how did that support gain traction in a time that didn't necessarily give credence to female value and, and female right. opinion? Well, Monterey at that time, uh, was, although Monterey has always been a fairly conservative community, it was kind of progressive at that time. There were a number of artists and writers living in the Monterey area at that time who she would have had a connection to. So Tony Jackson was a writer. She wrote for a local magazine called What's Doing. And of course, she was good friends for, with uh, John Steinbeck. And, uh, and so he had those connections. And so that's how it really started. And so they certainly approached those people. But as you pointed out, what I think is the most interesting part about all of that is it wasn't just those, the rich and famous that signed those petitions, but a lot of the local people who did so. And they did so under, under chances of losing their own livelihood. Right. And I think that was really important that they were able to get that. 
Okay. So another <coughs> question we have is that the, um, I think uh, the cre construction of the Carmel by the Sea yeah. is done by not only the white people, but also uh, Chinese and Japanese immigrants, right? right? I, I, I'd right. like to ask, you know, how much the Japanese immigrants were involved in the construction of the Carmel by the Sea at that time? Oh. Actually, quite a bit. So Noda, when he came to Monterey uh, about 1896, 1897, he was working for the then land arm of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Pacific Improvement Company, who at that point owned thousands of acres of the Monterey Peninsula, because they had this kind of weird, quirky idea they could turn Monterey into a tourist paradise. You think <laughs> such a thing? Right? That's right. There so, were tours of the, there were, uh, I'm pretty sure AMA gave tours of the cannery. Oh, Correct. Right. To, but uh, Noda, yeah. Noda was a labor contractor, and uh, and he had a partner who got an edict, and they were contracting Japanese laborers to clear the land, and that's what they did. They 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 provide these labor workers and 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 fed the camps and took care of them, and so those guys were really responsible for that. But it's also the farmers that you mentioned. So Miyamoto, who brought in the artichokes. Back when he first began to grow artichokes, no one around here knew how to eat them. So he actually used to have classes to teach people how to eat artichokes. That's funny. Uh, there was also uh, a Mr. Tanaka, who was also in the Carmel area, who was raising potatoes. He became known as the Potato King. And, uh, and so there was a, a couple of those guys who were doing that kind of thing that really, because Carmel went through a lot of weird kind of things. At one point, they were going to turn Carmel into sort of a Catholic retreat. Uh, but that never happened for a variety of reasons we won't go into. But but uh, there was that possibility, and then and then once the Chicago earthquake in 1906, uh, is all those Bohemians uh, from San Francisco we got out of San Francisco and came down and moved into Carmel. All those artists and writers and whatnot. Okay. But it was those Japanese workers who really was preparing the land for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, is there any other questions? Maybe we had the question about the Seizo Kodani, who was the oh uh, right, the son, son of, of Genosuke Kodani. Genosuke Kodani. Right. So I believe he was a firefighter. That yes. Right. And his position was kept until he came back from the internment camp, right. which is very special treatment compared right. to other you know residents. Well, Kodani family is still today is well known family in the Carmel area. And uh, Monterey, and I've made this point before, is a very unique community. So it's very small. That's one of the reasons I think that Monterey, as a community, stood up to welcome the Japanese home. Uh, it, you know, everybody went to school together. They all grew up together. They all played together. I mean, although Monterey at one point had a thriving Japan town, uh, you know, but their neighbors were those Sicilian guys right over the fence there. And I talked to a lot of those guys who told me that at Christmas time they would exchange food across the, you know, and things like that. So they all knew each other. Uh, you know, uh, Monterey is the only place where uh, that I have found where the fishermen had one union. Whereas in Northern California and Southern California, all the ethnic groups had separate unions. In Monterey, they had one. And I think that's primarily because it is a small town. Uh, but I believe the real key is that these guys all played baseball together. Yeah. It, and it was not uncommon for those young Japanese boys to learn to speak some Sicilian to Italian before they learned to speak English. And those Italian boys who learned to speak some Japanese before they learned to speak English. Again, Monterey is the only place I have found where that kind of thing happened. So I think that plays a big role in that story of Seizo Kodani when he came back and they held that role, uh, held that uh, job open for him like that. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. So you say that the cross knit society made it happen. Yes. Mm. I have found no other place like this in California that had that welcoming part where it was, where they, the the flag, you talked about the big flag that they built. Uh, uh, that flag, by the way, still exists. Oh, wow. It's not here in Monterey, unfortunately, but it is at the, at the museum, the Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles. They have it in their collection now. Um, but that flag was made by women. It was made yeah. right across the street where I am right now in the, in the ballpark where those guys all played baseball. 
And in 1937, they made that flag. And someone asked them why they made that flag it's so large. And the answer was, well, only a few people could ride on a float, but it took 60 people to carry that flag. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, is there any other questions from you guys? Yeah, I have a Both question, there. Tim. Uh, uh, Monterey having uh, a lot of uh, Japanese people that were formerly f from the fishing uh, areas of Japan. Right. Do you happen to know what part of Japan these people came from? Sure, so all those Amoni guys mostly come from the Chiba Prefecture. Um, and those guys came here on contracts, so they weren't really here to stay here yeah. for long yeah. periods of time, although there are a couple of them that did. Uh, most of them went back to Japan. And then other fishermen mostly come from uh, Hiroshima Prefecture, oh. um, a lot from that area. Yeah, and those are the guys who came to fish salmon and to fish sardine. And yeah, the one other question I want to ask, because I've heard, uh, I've been looking into the, the canning of the sardine. Right. Now, at the, in the beginning, uh, they were having difficulty canning the sardines because they just weren't, uh, wasn't coming out right. And I understand there was somebody from San Pedro conferred with somebody in Monterey, right. and Tom Foon was a, another name that has surfaced. Is that name any part of the canning? Because Tom Foon was involved with canning of tomatoes early in Santa Clara right. Valley. Well, I, I know what the issue with sardines in particular was how they were being processed. So initially they were, they were all cooked in hot oil. Uh, it was referred to as the French method, kind of like where French fries come from. Yeah. And there were problems with that, problems with that method, uh, particularly oil fires and stuff in the canneries. And it just wasn't that proficient. And there was a guy named A.P. Halfhill in San Pedro area who was in the, in the tuna business. And he's the guy that created the idea of steaming them in the cans. Mm -hmm. And oh. they began to steam all the, pro all the fish were steamed in the cans. That's how they cooked them. Uh, and that came from the San Pedro area. And that was a far more proficient method. It was cleaner, uh, a better tasting fish. And of course, the steam also ran all the machinery in the cannery. And that's yeah. actually when Kodani opened his cannery at Point Lobos, uh, he, uh, they began to can abalone the same way. That's how they did it at Point Lobos. And A.M. Allen, too, is a good point. A.M. Allen also was a very progressive guy. Uh, and uh, Allen, as you mentioned, owned all that property. Uh, and he leased it initially to Kodani. Uh, and he watched him operate for about a year. And then he said, hey, there is money to be made here. And uh, he, then he joined in and they became partners. Uh, but he was very progressive. Because you show, one of the photographs you showed was the memorial, memorial service held for Kodani after he died in 1930, right. which was held at a yeah. temple in Japan. Right. right. I've been to that temple, actually. And it still looks exactly like that. But, you know, they held a service for A.M. Allen because of, because of the job that he created. Interesting enough, his wife had passed away a few years before, and they held, actually held a service for her as well at that same temple. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You wrote that in your t uh, book. Yeah. Uh, we used as a ticket book. Uh, you know, for, for us, Japanese, uh, Chiba Prefecture is uh, just a suburb of Tokyo. You know? <laughs> yeah. But since it, I read your t uh, book, and find out that the, the funeral of the MA, yeah. AMA was held in Chiba Prefecture, I you know, came to realize that how fascinating city, a fascinating prefecture it is. Yeah. So I would like to visit Chiba Prefecture yeah. someday. Well, that area, uh, the Boso down there, that all, it, uh, it reminds me so much of Monterey. It's a little, it's a peninsula. You know, and uh, just so similar. So our museum here, we have paintings, contemporary paintings of that area of Japan. Everybody comes in and says it looks like Monterey. They all think the same thing. So they, they were comfortable when they got here. They felt it was a good place to be. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and also uh, in Montreal, there was a group of uh, people from Wakayama Prefecture. 
Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. And it seems like the, there is some tight relationship between Chiba Prefecture and Wakayama Prefecture in Japan yes. as well. Right. A lot of fishermen. Actually, I've given talks in the, in, the, in the Wakayama Prefecture. Uh, I gave a talk about a guy named Frank Manaka, who comes from that area, a town called Taiji, a little town uh, in, in Japan. Uh, it's famous because they hunt dolphins there, actually. Uh, but he, he, uh, I, uh, uh, but there's a town next to Taiji that has a restaurant called the Monterey Restaurant. Oh, and and the owners I didn't know why it was called Monterey. Well, it's because those guys are coming from the, to Monterey. In fact, I gave this talk about Frank Manaka in the town of Taiji there, and there was a gentleman in the audience who fished for Frank Manaka in the 1950s. That's crazy. <laughs> so there's that connection. It's just really an amazing thing. Yeah. Okay, then shall we move to the uh, San Jose area? Okay, so um, first of all, um, Mr. Warren Hayashi uh, is the live witness uh, of San Jose uh, 75 years ago. So when he came back from the internment camp, he was 11 years old. So that means that he's now 87 years old. Can you believe that? <laughs> he looks wow. so useful. And he, he has really clear memory, and he can speak very eloquently. So um, we are going to listen to his story when he came back to San Jose at the age of 11 years old. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in my preparation for this little discussion, uh, I tried to focus on the uh, discrimination part of my return. And one of the things that I come to realize, because when, before, before uh, we went to the camp, uh, I lived in Vacaville, which is a small farming community here in Northern California. And uh, being in a small community, everybody knew one, one another. And, and uh, I started elementary school, and I don't recall any kind of discrimination whatsoever. Kids were kids, and as as I progressed through, things started to change, and I, I could see the changes taking place because from the time that we went from our home to the uh, uh, what's called the assembly center, which is if you look at the history of all the assembly centers, they are all county fairgrounds in the state of California, and one of the and we stayed in one of the horse stalls. I could tell you a long story about all that, but we were there for roughly uh, three weeks, and then we ended up in Gila, Arizona, which is a uh, godforsaken country. The temperature r ranges from zero almost to 115 every every uh, you know each year. So it wasn't the ideal place, but it was a, a convenient place to put all the Japanese people. But even through that process and that experience, I didn't really uh, encounter any discrimination, but it was on the return. Mm. We left Arizona in uh, April of 1945, and my dad knew that he was not gonna go back to Vacaville mm. because he had already heard from his friends that the city council had passed a resolution that don't, we don't want the Japs to come back. That was, that was a, kind of a given statement that, that he had learned. So much like the Santa Clara Valley, Monterey, there are different areas. And you look at Salinas, completely different than Monterey. But uh, so when we came back, we stopped in the, in the town of Florin. Florin was a little farming town just south of Sacramento. And at that location, my dad must have known something that I, you know, uh, because we got off the train, we walked to the uh, Florin Methodist Church. And there he had arranged for us to live in the fellowship hall for uh, about three weeks till he got a job and housing and all that. So we lived there and, and it wasn't until 
the first day, um, uh, I guess it was after spring, spring vacation, I was enrolled into elementary school and probably had the worst experience as a child. Mm -hmm. And I came home and told my mom, I said, I don't want to go to school anymore. Mm -hmm. And she, I think she understood what, you know, the, 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 the impact that, you know, the response from the kids and they didn't come out and say things in a derogatory manner, but you knew that you were not welcome. And so shortly after that, uh, we ended up moving to Elk Grove, which is another suburb of Sacramento. But it was in the Sacramento County. And so uh, uh, it was just before school was out, actually, by that time, uh, we enrolled in a school, school, uh, school which was a one-room schoolhouse. And when school opened up in September and we finally got back into the classroom. We had one teacher and there were about, th I would say, 30 students, grades one through eight. So can you imagine being in a classroom? And uh, the, one of the beauties of this was we were a class, we, we sang songs, we did a lot of things collectively. But one of the things that was very uh, uh, apparent was the older girls, the eighth grade girls, used to help teach the first and second grade children. And so there was that team teaching concept that, uh, that uh, we often talk about. But while we were in that school, again, because all of the children were Japanese, there was no discriminatory attacks on one another. Everybody's the same, you know, just, and then, uh, in December of, uh, yeah, it was right during Christmas vacation, December of 1940-46, we moved to Santa Clara. And again, we moved to Santa Clara because my dad's best man was here in Santa Clara, and all of his friends from Wakayama were already here. Mm. And that made a big difference in, in the thinking of being together. But... Uh, my first day in school uh, in, in Santa Clara, uh, we go to this Jefferson Elementary School, which is no longer there. But because of the enrollment that uh, at that time, it was right after uh, we moved here, uh, right at, at the end of vac uh, Christmas vacation. So it was the second semester I entered the school. And my first experience there was there was a boy in the classroom that said something to me. He says, hey, Jap, you don't belong here. And I, you know, I, I didn't let it bother me. It just, I, I didn't respond or react to that. And so I, uh, the inter interesting thing was about three days later, he came back to me and he now called me by my first name. And all of a sudden now we were friends. But that response from that, that boy, I think this was, we were in the fifth grade, and he probably heard it from some adult. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what it meant, what, you know, w the impact it might have on people. But uh, yeah, at that same time, I have a friend. Uh, in fact, I see him today. Uh, you know, he and I have been friends since the fifth grade. He, but. He comes from a different cultural background. He came to California in the Dust Bowl. He's from Oklahoma. Mm. And so he tells me a lot of stories about his discrimination uh, coming from Oklahoma. The first thing he said was uh, when they stopped in Bakersfield and they were living there and he had an older sister, about six years older. She wanted to go to the movies and so she took him to the movies, and she, this movie theater in Bakersfield, uh, he said he could still remember it. He had a copy of it, but he doesn't have it now. There was a sign right inside the door. When you buy your ticket and you walk inside the theater, there was a sign that says, Okies and Mexicans upstairs. <laughs> Everybody else is downstairs. Though nothing about blacks, because oh. that, that, the blacks were not 
I don't think they were uh, in this area yet. They were coming, but they weren't here yet. But the, the, the people that came from Oklahoma and even Texas during the Dust Bowl in the, I guess it must have been the late 30s, uh, you know, they uh, uh, had this experience. And so when he came to Santa Clara and entered his school, uh, elementary school, he told me that his mother, you know, kids from Oklahoma, they all wear overalls and cowboy boots. And he was criticized for that. So his mother took him to uh, the store right away and bought him some new clothes. But his experience uh, in, in uh, Jefferson, because on that first day that we all came back, uh, he had a seat, you know, one of these seats that, you, you, if you remember what old classroom desks look like, the seat that folds up. Well, the teacher said to him, uh, I want you to share your seat with this fellow boy named Tetsuo Fujimoto. As Tets, the, and so Wayne is his, my friend's name. He said he went home and told his mother that, oh, guess what happened today? I, I had to share my seat with a Jap. And boy, his mother just sat him down and gave him a 30-minute lecture on, <laughs> you don't use those kinds of terms, Aww. you know. And because she was, uh, uh, fortunately, she was, she was a, a, a college graduate, I mean, Aww. real early. Educated and women, yeah. She, uh, she was a wonderful lady. I, I, uh, I uh, you know, I admired her tenacity, the, the hard work that she went through and all. And she lived to be 106 years old, and I went to her 105th birthday. Wow! So, yeah. So uh, it was. Uh, but those are the those were the only real experiences that I've had direct experiences of being discriminated against. Now, I know a lot of other people that came to this area. Most of them were a little bit older than me at the time had trouble buying a house here in San Jose, but it was only in one particular section of town. And that was in Willow Glen. Mm. Japanese people, for whatever reason, the neighborhood people, they just kind of ganged together and said, uh, don't sell your house to a Jap. You know, oh. that was, and that went on for a while, but uh, I think it, it kind of took care of itself in a matter of time because I'm pleased to say that in my neighborhood of Willow Glen where I grew up uh, there was uh, we moved in in 1965 uh, there was a, a Japanese the family still there the Japanese family next door uh, had been there since at least 1960 perhaps a little yeah, bit it was perhaps a little bit earlier yeah cause but yeah but I I've heard those stories too yeah cuz uh, in the 50s that's when they were trying to buy a house now in my particular case I didn't have any problems I had no trouble of course I wasn't buying in Willow Glen either so uh part of it has to do with the neighborhood and uh, and there are still Japanese people that live in that particular area the fellow that I know who was told uh, that he couldn't buy the house where he lives so but uh, those were just very few stories that, that have evolved. That, that wasn't the general rule. I'm surprised but, that that went into even the 1950s. Yeah, it was the 50s uh, when Jimmy uh, tried to buy a house. Uh, uh, yeah. Surprised. So, uh, but those are probably the extent of the discriminatory things that, I, that I've experienced and I've heard direct comments from people, but. Uh, and also I heard that you know, when we interviewed with you, uh, interview you, uh, you talked about the story that you ran for the president of the high school, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah when I was in high school, I, I, I was, uh, you know, when I went to high school, I'll just give you a background on my, my thinking at the time. Uh, well, f let me go back. One of the things that my mother, my mother was born here in Oakland, and but yet she was educated partly in Japan, but she lived all her life here in the United States. 
And uh, one of the things that she uh, uh, ingrained in us is, you know, you live in the United States and so you want to assimilate to, to the country that you're living in. And no matter what happens uh, elsewhere, you know, you've got to be part of the community. And so that kind of thinking that uh, I kind of grew up with when I was going through, when I got to high school, I was very active in, uh, I was president of a club called the Panther Knights. This is a high school group. This, uh, this was a uh, uh, social group, but also we did service at the school. But then come my senior year and we have student body elections. So I don't know what possessed me, but I decided I'm gonna run for student body president. <laughs> so I run for student body president and I'm running against the principal's son. Oh. <laughs> and today he's still my friend, but uh, our election was really very close. And, uh, and it wasn't until, it was about four o'clock in the afternoon, I was playing baseball. I was on the baseball team, I was a catcher. And I could hear this guy in the, in the stands, he's yelling for, rooting for me. And I thought, oh, I'll bet he won the election. <laughs> and come to find out, he told me, he says, you know, I only, I only won by five votes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so in some ways I was glad because I didn't know. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but that's been, you know, those are the, so as far as the uh, issues of uh, discrimination and then, you know, I really didn't have much uh, difficulty. One thing that I had to relearn uh, going through high school, all my friends were Portuguese and Italians no. and a few Mexican kids and a couple of Okies like, uh, and so socially and all, I, I didn't have the problem. I didn't get into any, have any confrontation with anybody else. But it was after I got out of high school I started learning to, uh, thinking to myself, you know, I was, first of all, I was 17 when I graduated from high school. I just turned 17. And so that in itself, I didn't realize it was kind of a negative on me because socially I wasn't really ready to go out in the world. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to, you know, my, my parents want me to go to college and I, I had no idea where to go. And one of my teachers in high school suggested that, uh, she said, you know, she said, I think you should enroll in John, Ho John Hopkins University. Oh. She says, I'll help you pick, help your way. She was, a, she was a single teacher and she was, I don't know what possessed her to say that to me, but I didn't know where John Hopkins was. I didn't know <laughs> if it was on the moon, you know, and, and I had, I had no idea and I said, you know, thank you. I just, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> so I ended up uh, going to uh, San Jose City College and City College had just moved off of the San Jose State Campus. Mm -hmm. Used to be over here on uh, 7th and San Fernando. Mm -hmm. They moved it, built a new campus over, in fact, it was closer to where I live. And so I decided, well, I'll just go here because it, it won't cost me money. I mean, I, I can save money and I'll just continue on. And my experiences there was, again, my friends, uh, the first time I encountered this was, here I am, out, just fresh out of high school. I'm still 17. I'm out to play football and after football, these guys tell me, hey, I'll meet you at club four. I look at it, what's club four? Well, down from the college, there's a, uh, there's a bar called club four. <laughs> but I didn't realize that these guys are all veterans of Korean War. They had just come back. Oh. They are 22, 23, 24 year old guys. Mm. And having a beer is no big deal. They've had, you know, but here I'm 17. I don't even know what a beer smells like. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. but. It's, it's, all, it's all the experiences that one learns and how you look at other people. And so uh, 
people are people, whether they're 25, 22, 17, or 16, you know. And so uh, the discriminatory side of me just never existed. But I did see it on the, uh, from other people. But in most cases, I suspect uh, they, those, those kids inherited from some adult. Mm. That's why that, I'm glad you became an educator so you could pass on your yeah. <laughs> right, you know, experience your yeah. to yeah, exactly. children. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. yeah. Okay, so uh, now we shift the topic to canneries because, you know, um, Monterey is very f famous for cannery, mm -hmm. and, but, you know, we didn't know about, you know, San Jose as a cannery yeah. mm -hmm. until we researched, yeah. you know. So uh, we didn't have enough time to get into that cannery very much, except the uh, Tom, Thomas mm, Fu yeah. case. So if you have uh, any further information regarding the cannery in San Jose, please provide us. Oh, yeah. The, uh, uh, at that uh, particular period of time in, Sa in Santa Clara Valley, farming was the product that was being produced. And if you look at the Japantown, uh, the uh, Japantown actually ended at, at 7th Street. On the other side of 7th, you could just look for blocks of just nothing but canneries. You had Richmond Chase, you had Tri-Valley, you had Del Monte Cannery. I mean, there's, everybody was there. And so every year in, in, the, in the spring and the summer months, you could smell the fruits all being canned, and and uh, it was a very busy place. Mm -hmm. And and of course, uh, right on the end of Seventh Street, uh, there was a uh, the, the the San Jose Produce Company was there. So produce coming in from all over the valley, they would uh, distribute it there to the restaurants and uh, and uh, and grocery stores and places like that. So. It was a whole, that whole neighborhood was very busy, really busy place. And uh, so, but as time went on, and, and as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, uh, the, the face of Japantown started changing. But the big changes started just not all at once, but as each family, because the Japantown, in the, in the uh, years after the war, when everybody came back, San Jose had a lot of uh, ethnic communities where people would go do their shopping. And everybody in San Jose uh, opened their businesses on Thursday night because the farmers could stop work and come and do their shopping. Oh. Otherwise, they couldn't come during the day. Mm -hmm. So whether it was downtown, First Street, which was the main business section of San Jose, you know, whether it was uh, Japantown or whether it was uh, the Italian com community, everybody opened their businesses on Thursday night. So everybody would come in and, and do their, get their supplies that they need, you know, so. So is there any addition regarding the cannery in San Jose, Ralph Sang? Um. Well, this is a, a, a wonderful experience here. I'm doing more learning than it, <laughs> any, anything else. Uh, and so this is, this is very interesting. Um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in hearing about uh, canneries, in, uh, uh, that that was going to be one of the topics, I tried looking into the canneries a little more because I don't know much about um, the canneries' uh, relationship, really in terms of Japantown and the Japanese community. Um, and so delving into that, um, I, it, it, was, it was kind of difficult uh, to pull out uh, uh, real specific information in terms of numbers. Um, but what I was seeing was that, especially uh, pre-war, um, that it was the, the cannery workers were very heavily made up of um, a lot of other uh, minority groups, uh, predominantly Italian. Yes. Um, but we had a lot of other uh, and as I recall, I, I believe other groups, um, including um, Asians or Asian groups, were probably less than uh, 18% of the um, 
uh, employment numbers uh, in, the, in the canneries. And I also read that three out of four canneries would not employ um, Asians at all. Oh. Um, but that still left, uh, we had uh, quite a number of canneries, I forget, 40, 50 canneries uh, that operated. So that still left quite a number of, of canneries available that, that, that would employ. Um, and of course, we had the, the, uh, the Choose uh, up in Alviso, uh, which was a, a large employer of uh, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Filipino um, uh, workers there. And we also had one, one Japanese cannery, one uh, Japanese-owned uh, cannery in what? Mountain View. Wow, I didn't but know that. They, they existed, well, they were in operation from about 1919 through 1921. Wow. And it's not clear um, what caused their demise. It may have had something to do with the, the land laws. Uh, that uh, were coming in. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's really neat so, information. Yeah, I, I'd be interested in learning more about the canneries because, of course, we have so many canneries, like Warren said, that surrounds Japantown. Um, but uh, I was never really able, you know, through the interviews uh, that I've done and, and the reading that I've done, uh, which is what I rely on, and people like Warren, um, <laughs> um, uh, we, we would get, uh, uh, you know, we, we we weren't really able to get a good, or I wasn't able to get a good number, a, a good feel of, of the, 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 the number that were employed there. Um, I do recall that one of the Dabashi boys uh, sought work there uh, right after the war and they turned him away. They did, huh? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so I, I know that there were, there were uh, Japanese, Japanese Americans employed there, um, but, but of course it, that was seasonal as yeah. well, so everybody, oh, yeah. everybody was involved in farming and agriculture in so many different ways, and the, and the Japanese needed to be very creative mm -hmm. uh, just to, to get by because, they, they, because of the, the, the oppression on them, the, all of these uh, forces at play trying to uh, keep them down in the, in the range of cheap labor and keep them from, from really uh, prospering too much. Mm -hmm. And so they had to get very creative with all these land laws that sought to keep them down and so it's amazing all the different forms of employment that they were able to uh, create um, and, and take part in. Um, it's it's, it's, uh, it's quite, yeah, quite interesting. Ralph is right. Uh, the predominant employees were uh, Italians and, and Portuguese. Because if you look on 13th Street, used to be a, an Italian village there. That, that's where all the Italian markets were uh, at that period of time. Then. Is it because of the owner of the cannery were white? What, what is the reason? What, what well, there were, a, for one thing, there were a lot of Italians. Yeah, there's lots of Italians. Uh, and, in ta and Italians um, made up a large portion of Japantown. Of the Japan, they did early on, Japantown yeah. Japantown area. Yeah. yeah. It was actually, the, most of those people moved in during the internment period when the Japanese all left. They came in and took over all the vacant houses and they moved in and uh, then when the Japanese people came back, they had to go someplace else. Well, there were quite a few, there were quite a few in Japantown even, even pre-war. Pre-war, yeah. yeah. Well, they lived around, uh, there was, uh, uh, because 13th and Jackson Street is where the big Italian, uh, the, one of the Italian uh, centers. There and was another nine, one in and on 19th Street too, down at uh, I believe uh, Taylor and 19th. There was another enclave down there. You know they were all yeah. Over. There there were small uh, uh, markets all over town. Yeah yeah. Yeah, there's still there's still a few around, uh, but uh, but the uh, the interesting thing uh, I met with one of the uh, ladies from uh, the Italian community, and they were trying to find a site that they can establish uh, old Italy. Mm -hmm. And of all the places I thought they would choose, uh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't pick that 13th Street, because I thought that, but what happened in that 13th Street, with the exception of one Italian family, that was only one left, everybody else, uh, the businesses that they had were taken over by other ethnic groups. And uh, 
most of the people didn't want to move back there because that was important and the Holy, I think it was Holy Cross Church and Bacastle Park. That was all part of the Italian community. Mm -hmm. And the church was really important, but it burned down. Oh. Right, right. And so after that, it kind of lost its desire, uh, you know, for people to move back to that neighborhood because they wanted to reestablish an Italian community mm. like the old days, but mm. they just couldn't do it. Don't you think that the, this situation is very similar to Montreal yeah. in terms of the ratio of the ethnic group? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Italians and Portuguese right. are the main I'm ethnic sharing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's uh, in terms of the the. Uh, the, the welcoming back to the Santa Clara Valley. I mean, um, you know, these, these Nisei children, the second generation children, um, they went to school, uh, you know, at Grant Elementary and, and uh, Peter Burnett Junior High and San Jose High School. Um, and they're, they're friends, you know, they were all, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, they were just friends. They were just people. Um, they weren't, uh, they, you know, they, 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 they didn't see the the uh, the racial differences. They were all American kids, and you know, there were little things. Some of the kids would bring, you know, maybe some kind of uh, a rice and something. You know, they have something a little different, a little ethnic in their lunch, but uh, um, uh, they were friends, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. and something that that the uh, that the other fellow mentioned from Monterey about baseball mm -hmm. um, is uh, San Jose, uh, I my first book was on uh, the Japanese American baseball uh, team in San Jose, which started about 1913. And by 1918, they restarted the, it kind of faltered and then they restarted the, the team. It was picked up by a um, San Jose Mercury News uh, uh, columnist, uh, Jack Graham who promoted uh, baseball in San Jose. And he lived just down on uh, 6th Street, on North 6th Street, and he was just a walk away uh, from uh, uh, the baseball field, the first field that was there on, uh, on uh, 6th and uh, Jackson Street. And he started writing about the Asahi uh, uh, regularly and reporting on them regularly. He went, obviously went down there and watched the games, got to knew the, know the players, and he started inviting the general public, the uh, outside of Japantown, to come down and see these guys play. And next thing you knew, uh, they were playing uh, on, in uh, regular city leagues, um, and other teams were uh, arranging to borrow their field. Um, and eventually, by 1925, they built a, a, a very large, full-size stadium out at uh, 7th and Younger Streets. Um, but, and so you can just imagine all of the friendships that were formed, uh, not only on the field, but in the stands, the mixed crowds that were getting to know each other. Um, and so you had, you had so many years uh, uh, of this before the war. So, um, you know, during the war, there were so many, uh, you know, we, we have many, many instances of discrimination, but there are just as many, uh, if, if, if not more, uh, that we haven't even heard of, of, of acts of kindness and friendship um, uh, to each other. And so there are so many uh, farmers uh, uh, that I know of who watched over their neighboring Japanese-American uh, farms uh, during the war, so that they had those farms to return to uh, when, when 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 they came yeah, back. That's sweet. That is very sweet. Yeah. So so I, I I think the baseball and just the friendship and 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 the uh, uh, the friendships that uh, were were developed played a very important critical role, and of course Japantown uh, itself uh, played a very uh, critical role uh, to it. Yeah. And, yeah. You, know, you mentioned the uh, Nihon, uh, Nihon Machis in California. There was 42 of them in California, and every one of those Nihon Machis had a baseball team. Oh. Yeah, it was big, because here in San Jose, uh, I've seen pictures. I wasn't there, so I've seen pictures of people lined up on the right field fence, the left field fence on a Sunday, and they're playing baseball. I mean, that's just it's amazing Exciting. how 
how they would come. And that was a big thing. Mm. Now, well, and it was in the days before uh, television and <laughs> yeah. so many other yeah. uh, uh, sports. Uh, well, the only other thing that was in and competition. The East, and the Issei loved baseball because they yeah. actually brought it from Japan. They yeah. had baseball in Japan. Yeah. The other thing that the other social outlet for the Japanese before the war was uh, uh, the uh, uh, Okita Hall. There's a hall there on 6th Street, Okita Hall. Okita hall. They used to show uh, Japanese movies oh. on Saturday. And they had actual no dramas. Yeah. They, yeah. they had actual they had, performances wow. from Japan. Yeah, they would, would have, uh, they would so they have a talent can, show and things can. like that. Yeah. So it was a Most very, Japanese. very active Most community. Can I and, chime in for a second here? Just about baseball and some of the cannery. So it, again, my baseball, as I mentioned, was sort of a unifying factor. And uh, here in Monterey, of course, the Monterey boys who play against those Sicilian boys all were fishermen. And on Sundays, they'd have double headers. And they always hoped they wouldn't go into extra innings because you fish sardine at night. You had to get down to the boats by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So you'd, if you go into extra innings, you couldn't finish the baseball game because you had to go fishing to do that. <laughs> also, in canneries, in terms of the canneries, of course, after World War II, the, the Monterey Sardine canneries employed a lot of Japanese workers, primarily because they had the skills. Uh, and uh, they were welcomed back into these canneries because there was a big demand for the sardines at that point. And so they were really pushing to get them back to work in the canneries. And, and uh, Noda, of course, had the first cannery uh, on what is now present-day Cannery Road that he opened in 1902, Monterey Fish and Cannon Company. Uh, he had an American partner, a guy named Harry Malpas, but they operated for five years at that cannery down there. And then my good friend Larry Oda, who was uh, 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 his grandfather, had the Sea Pride Cannery in 1926, which was all Japanese-owned, the only one on the, in Monterey at that time, all Japanese-owned cannery. So, real important. Uh, let me ask you a question, Tim. Yeah. The, the Fish House restaurant on, I think it's on... Fremont. No, not on Fremont, on Del Monte. Is that, is, is that still owned by the same couple that started it? I believe so. Oh, that's amazing, because it's a Japanese lady. It's one of the best, it Italian, is the best restaurant in Monterey. <laughs> yeah. A good, a good restaurant. Okay, yeah. let's yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah. maybe it might yeah. be a last question. Uh, were there any business partnership like Kodani and AMA uh, partnership in San Jose? Like that kind of relationship in San Jose? I don't recall any. I don't recall. The only partnerships that I know of were brothers in the same family. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, like we think of one family, there were three brothers and they, they shared the, the, the farming business and they split the profits and all that. Uh, but I, I don't know, the only other one that, that I'm really familiar with is uh, the one down in uh, uh, Monterey, uh, the uh, you know, Tanamura Antle partnership. Oh, it's Salinas. It's now, yes, it's now in the third generation uh, uh, of the Tanamura family. In fact, Gary was the, uh, he's the third generation. He re just retired too, so I'm not sure which member is going to take, you know, take over. But that is a beautiful partnership. It, it is a, it's a model business. Mm. And during the time that, the, the original owner was George Tanamura, and when he was in camp, Bud Antle took care of the place, and that was his, you know, his friend. And I'm, I'm not sure where Bud Antle came from, but uh, I think he, he was, was new okay. to the area. He was okay too. Oh, he's right. yeah. He was from Oakland. Uh, no, oh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oklahoma. <laughs> but yeah, that's. But I. Uh, but but there were. Um, there were really a large number of, uh, uh, well, a lot, a lot of uh, Japanese cooperatives amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. That was one way that they that they survived was through uh, cooperatives amongst uh, between uh, Japanese uh, themselves, um, and a lot of uh, creative partnerships uh, with uh, American Caucasian 
uh, uh, farmers. But it, my impression was that they tended to be more like seasonal uh, partnerships and a lot of times informal, mm -hmm. just, uh, just an agreement. I, I came up with one example in 1909, there, a, a Tiga Ishida uh, uh, entered an oral agreement with the giant, uh, John Heinlein uh, company, John Heinlein, who uh, started uh, uh, Chinatown in 1887, yes. which became Japantown. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they arranged to grow a potato crop in uh, Edenvale uh, for half the uh, gross return. So they shared uh, the profit from that uh, particular harvest. So this was common. Uh, there were a lot of common informal uh, uh, agreements, but I think that would just uh, would be would be seasonal. Mm. Now, yeah. did John Heinlein own that land? Oh, yes. He, he probably owned. He it. owned land all over the the county. Yeah. Because uh, that's one of the reasons why they would go into a partnership was the Japanese pa partner could not own the land, mm. and so exactly. but it's the Japanese person had the farming skills, mm. and that's where the partnerships worked out. Yeah, and also uh, Tom Foon uh, Chu uh, uh, not only had the cannery, but he also assisted in, um, had partnerships uh, in other areas uh, oh, really? of, uh, of the county to, to assist uh, Japanese. Uh, what, kind? what kind of, is this all? Yeah, same <laughs> Oh, I, I, I refer you to um, um, uh, the Garden of the, the book, Garden, in, uh, Garden of the World um, by Tsu. I forget her uh, first name. Uh, that's an excellent reference to um, to uh, farming uh, uh, and uh, Asian uh, farming in the Santa Clara County. That book, and also another book that I, I've I've been reading is uh, Luke's and Okahiro, Japanese Legacy. So those two books offer a fairly good overview of uh, farming in the valley from the Asian perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, is there any other question you want to ask? I think so. I think I'm tapped dry. <laughs> I'm liking all the stories I know. that I'm listening. To, honestly, because I was like, I was like enjoying a story that Warren was sharing. I was like, oh, do you remember more stories that happened in Japantown? Because I would love to hear <coughs> about it. Because now that you can like walk like on the crosswalk and see all of that, but then right. now you have the stories to attach it to. Yeah. Right. Like, right. Like even a more yeah. special place. Well, let me get back. I, I started to mention this earlier. Uh, the the changing of Japantown, you know. After the war, when everybody came back, uh, the families all had their businesses. Most of the families lived above the store or in the back. A few people had homes out on the uh, north side of town. But as the people my age uh, finish high school, they go to college, get a degree, and 90% of them did not come back because they pursued their new uh, venture, whatever it was, whether it was medicine or business or whatever, and, but they didn't want to come back and be a retail merchant. Mm -hmm. And so that happened to uh, most of them, except for a couple that I, the Kogura brothers that I went to school with. And uh, of course, there's, there's a long story in that family that there was a big split up in that family. but. As this happened, and then the owners, the the parents, reach retirement age, and they retire, and they have nobody to take care of the business, mm. so they just retire and and uh, either use uh, the property that they have, uh, lease it for something else. Most of them became restaurants, really. Mm -hmm. A lot of them did, uh, but that's how it slowly begin to fade and through the 70s uh, I was watching the changes in the, in all the businesses the big thing that has came to to uh, Japantown was restaurants mm -hmm. because in the early years there was only one well actually well I could say three restaurants only one Japanese restaurant there was a Chinese two Chinese restaurants and that was it mm -hmm. so yeah just to kind of if I have time I, I created like just like a little summary mm -hmm. of uh, San Jose, Japantown. But in terms of like just a quick little overview of the growth and importance of San Jose, Japantown, um, really, really began taking off after the San Francisco earthquake. 
1906. A lot of people came down from San Francisco. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it really took off between, uh, you know, 1906 by uh, 1910, um, where we had a, a hospital there. We had dental care. Now this is all, this is all, you know, to provide support to the Japanese community, not just the community of Japantown, but the, the, commu the community of the valley. Um, so we had uh, uh, medical care, dental care, midwives. We had grocery, clothing, supplies, entertainment, uh, worship. We had uh, both the Buddhist church and the Wesley Methodist church. Um, uh, they could help with housing. We had boarding houses. It was a, a place, especially in the early years, where the, 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 the men could live and, and, and get work. Um, and there was a hotel for people who had to travel by horseback, you know, and buggies, and they could stay overnight there uh, at, at the hotel. Uh, they had, there was networking, which was critical uh, to, to survival and uh, potential financial assistance and whatnot. And in terms of the question of the survival of uh, Japantown, um, uh, I think uh, I was kind of thinking on that as kind of a fun thing to think about. Um, uh, they, uh, they, they were so well, you can see that they were so well established. They were so important and critical to the community. Um, and their location, they were, they were outside of, they were away from the center of town. And so even when they, it was constructed initially as Chinatown, there was some opposition, but they were on the edge of the community. And so they weren't receiving so much uh, uh, pressure. Uh, they, they, they were allowed to, to build and, and exist. And they were near the fields and, 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 and the factories, the canneries, uh, where they were seeking employment. Um, and, and, uh, and then, of course, another critical factor was the wartime efforts of uh, Ben Peckham uh, to really save the businesses and, uh, uh, that, that were there. And a lot of them were manned by Chinese, Filipinos, uh, Caucasian. Uh, came in in the meantime, and they leased or subleased, uh, ultimately through Peckham, mm -hmm. uh, which which kept things. He facilitated the the existence, you know, uh, so that they would be there when they got back. And then, just as critically, um, they were not subject to um, to modification mm -hmm. as a tourist attraction, uh -huh. uh, as That's we've seen in, in the, San Francisco, in San Francisco, and in Los Angeles. Um, so they're not a Japan town. They are a genuine Japanese American town. Oh. Mm. So. The purely kept right. mm -hmm. of a Japanese American town. Is yeah. Special. But, you know, like all things in life, the change is a constant. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Warren says, why it's, uh, it's, 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 it's been changing. <laughs> but not all for, for uh, you know, um, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, but I'm just uh, grateful that it's it's still there, mm -hmm. and I think that it serves kind of a sim symbolic uh, a purpose uh, uh, too. Uh, uh, you know, it speaks to our s sense of inclusion uh, uh, in, in 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 the valley, and an inclusion that I really appreciate being uh, having grown up here. You know, all the different um, ethnicities, the kids that I grew up with, and you don't even think about it. And it really provides a, a richness uh, uh, to our, our experience, uh, which I, I, re I really appreciate. OK, sure. They were pre-war. Yeah, my uh, co-author uh, and friend, uh, Kurt Fukuda, just did a wonderful um, uh, video on Hakone Gardens, and he and he uh, discusses the whole the whole history of that. I um, I'm not sure if it's up yet on YouTube, but uh, it's fairly recently that that he did that. But but the history goes back pretty far back, as I recall. And this was fairly far from where the Japanese Americans lived, right? Oh yes, yes. Thank you very much. We have a tons of questions we want to ask you, but it's running of time, uh, unfortunately. 
So today, we have examined the similarities between Montreux and San Jose from various perspectives. To conclude, I want to emphasize that Montreux residents and San Jose students and faculty members openly exchange their opinions in the newspapers, local newspapers and campus newspapers, uh, and uh, which was very impressive for us. And we learned that, you know, uh, what we can do for our democracy, which is being challenged right now. I hope that these uh, Montreux and San Jose immigration cases offer to you some hope and courage for our democracy tonight. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for joining us our event. And have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.